Hello, beautiful souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. Before I start, I just want to let you guys know I'm still really sick. So if my voice sounds weird or I start losing my voice, I apologize. I just decided I was going to do this video no matter how bad I felt. So here we are. Today's story takes place in Darlington, England. Julie Patterson did not have an easy childhood. Her mother died of a brain tumor when Julie was still an infant and Julie and her brother Michael were then raised by their father. By the time Julie was 32 years old, she had four children of her own. She had lost custody of the three eldest children, but she still had custody of the youngest daughter. The father of Julie's youngest child was Alan Taylor, and at the time when this story takes place, Julie and Alan were in a relationship living together, raising their young daughter. As I had mentioned, Julie had never had an easy life. She had dealt with depression for most of her life. Julie also had an addiction to alcohol and Valium. It was not uncommon for Julie to go out to the pub at night on her own and not return for days at a time. There was actually one point where she had been gone for an entire week, but she had never been gone longer than a week. In April 1998, Julie decided that she was going to go to the pub for the night. Alan stayed home with their young daughter. And Julie didn't return the next day, which was not in any way alarming at all to Alan because this was something Julie had done on a regular basis. As the days went on and Julie still didn't return, Alan initially, he wasn't that concerned. It was very common for her to go and be gone up to a week. So he didn't have much concern. He just thought she's out partying and she'll come home when she's done. Now the older children that Julie had, she didn't have custody of them, but she did have visits with those children. And Julie never missed a visit with any of her older children. If she had a visit scheduled with one of her older children, she had never before been late or missed that appointment. Once Alan realized that Julie had missed this appointment for a visit with her daughter, he became very alarmed because he knew this was extremely out of character and he didn't believe that Julie would ever willingly miss a visit with her daughter. So Alan started to call her friends, family, neighbors, anyone that knew Julie to see if anyone had heard from Julie. No one he spoke to had heard anything from Julie in days. And so then he started going around Darlington to all of the pubs to see maybe she was in one or she could ask if she had been there. But unfortunately, Alan could not find anyone who had seen Julie in many days. When Alan was unable to find Julie, he called the police to report her missing. Police, when they were searching, had search dogs that were trying to pick up to see if any of them could find Julie's scent. On May 16th, 1998, a dog handler was walking his dog and the dog picked up Julie's scent along a fence area. On the other side of the fence was a dilapidated house and the officer assumed no one lived there. He just believed that it was an abandoned house. So he went to check out the house. As he started walking closer to the house, a woman came out of the house and he realized this wasn't an abandoned house. This woman lived there. She came out of her house and asked the police officer, what are you doing on my property? The police officer told her that the dog had picked up Julie Scent, who was a missing woman in the area. And I find this part really strange. But the woman just pointed 
kind of to the end area of the fence and said that a few days ago, a couple teenage boys had dropped a bag there. She had assumed that it was a dead dog because of the smell. But if, if you suspect that somebody has left a dead animal on your property, you wouldn't investigate that or call someone. Like I, I found this part really confusing, but the woman just directed him to this bag. As soon as the police officer got close enough to the bag, he could smell a smell that he knew very well. He was smelling body decomposition. And inside the bag was Julie's torso. Obviously at this point, he doesn't know it's Julie's torso, but assuming, you know, you're looking for a missing woman and you find a torso, but they did take the torso obviously in to get tested and it was proven to be Julie's torso that this police officer had found. Well, actually it was the dog really that found her. So good job, doggy. When the police had taken the bag in to be examined, yes, there was a torso in there and yes, they were able to determine it was Julie, but none of her other body parts were with the torso. They have her torso and that's it. Before it was public knowledge that the police had found Julie's torso, someone started telling people that he had killed someone named Julie. It was a 24 year old man named David Harker. David had been going around to all the local pubs bragging that he had killed someone named Julie. He told all of his friends that he had killed someone named Julie, but David was a man who told really exaggerated stories. He would make up lies and tell crazy outlandish stories. So when he started telling people that he had killed someone, no one believed him. This wasn't the case that we usually in true crime, you'll find the killer has bragged to friends and friends are like, oh, I don't want to be involved. I'm not going to tell the police. But in this case, it wasn't the friends didn't want to tell the police. The friends really didn't believe that it was true. They just thought this was some sick joke by David. David Harker had had a very troubled childhood and he had problems with the law from a very, very young age. Trigger warning for animal stuff if you wanna fast forward like five seconds. David was very well known to mutilate and kill animals. And you know, as well as I know, anybody who's doing weird, fucked up shit to animals, they always move on to humans. And at just 16 years old, David had gone up and started a fight with two grown men and their dog. Now I'm thinking, okay, you've got a 16 year old kid, and I don't know how big David was, but let's just even say he was a large 16 year old. Let's say he was six feet foot tall. He's going into a fight with two grown men and a dog. Like how does he think that's gonna work? Like that doesn't sound like it's gonna end well for David. But unfortunately, the humans were fine. It was the dog that it didn't end well for. And for that incident, David spent a very brief amount of time in a detention center. But there were two sides to David. All we've talked about so far is the evil, horrible side of David, but David had a very different way of presenting himself to the world. To 
to most of David's friends, he seemed like a really great guy. He was very charming, he was popular, he was funny, and he was always up for a good time with his friends. So his friends had a really good impression of him. And that's what the research says. But he also bragged about killing a woman and his friends thought he was joking. So was he really this great fun guy? I don't know, they seem to think so. David was also good looking and he did very well with the ladies. Women loved this man and women were always vying for his attention. David also had a big interest in punk rock music. When he was a teenager, he was actually the lead singer of a band called Downfall. A lot of the kids in the punk rock scene really admired David and they really looked up to David. So he really could present himself in a way that people didn't fear him. They really liked him. And I mean, this is so common with killers. They always have, well, not always, most of the time, they have this very amazing, charming personality they put out to the world. And then they have this psycho side that they try to hide from the world. So I'm thinking that's David. David had also shaved both sides of his head so that he could get the names of his favorite bands tattooed on his head. So on one side of his head, he had disorder tattooed. On the other side of his head, he had subhumans tattooed. So that seems super healthy and well adjusted to me. What? David fell into a very deep depression when his girlfriend had broken up with him. They had a four-year-old son together and she moved out and took their son with her and David was devastated. His drinking increased enormously and he was just full of rage. He was belligerent, rude, getting into arguments with anyone and everyone. And he was just a ball of rage that was just ready to explode at any moment. One time he was in a pub in Darlington and he got so angry that he punched his fist through a glass window. So at this point, he's getting angry enough that he's punching his fist through glass windows. Okay, I think we have a problem. David was also an avid true crime fan. He loved reading books about serial killers. And if you're side-eyeing yourself right now, don't worry. I'm side-eyeing myself right now. It's okay to read about it. It's okay to be interested in it, but it's not okay to do it. David also told his friends he was gonna become a really famous serial killer one day, and he knew how to get away with his crimes so he would never get caught. Okay, David. Uh, he also named himself Devil Man. Not very interesting or original, but okie dokie. So that was just a bit of information so you could kind of get to know what David was like. So now David is still going around and bragging about killing someone named Julie. He had told almost 30 people that he had killed someone named Julie. And again, the friends don't take it serious until the news starts reporting about a woman named Julie who has been murdered. And all of a sudden his friends are like, hold on a second, could this be true? So a group of his closest friends, they all decided to meet up and talk about this. 
and the, the whole group got together and they all discussed like he said he killed someone named Julie. There's someone named Julie who's dead. They found her torso and they kind of went back and forth for a little while. And at the end of the meeting, the best friend of David decided he was going to the police because the police needed to know that David was going around telling people that he had killed someone named Julie. Whether he had actually done it, his friend wasn't sure, but he knew at this point the police needed to know. And good job, friend, because a lot of times in these cases, the killer will brag to people and the people, they don't go to the police. They just keep the information to themselves. So good job, David's best friend. You did the right thing. When his friend had gone to the police, David was already in custody. He had been charged with robbery and was being held at the jail. So the police decided to obtain a search warrant to search David's home to see if possibly this was true and he had killed Julie. When the police got to David's apartment and they opened the front door, police didn't need to take a single step into his apartment to know that someone had been murdered there. The apartment floors and walls were covered in dried blood. It was, dried blood was literally covering everything in the apartment. He had made no attempt to clean up the crime scene. There were drag marks from the staircase to the kitchen, so they could tell that someone had been killed near the staircase and their body had then been drugged into the kitchen. And when they walked in the kitchen, there were meat hooks hanging from the ceiling. So it was clear he had not just murdered this girl. He had done a lot more than that. Then they went down to the basement and the basement was even bloodier than the upstairs, which they were shocked that there was that much blood everywhere, all over the house, all in the basement. Like there was a lot of blood and police had tested the blood and knew that it was Julie's blood. So they knew that this was where Julie had been murdered. They also found clothing and other belongings of Julie in the basement. The apartment itself was filthy and messy, not just obviously from the murder that had occurred. It was it was a very dirty, messy apartment, and he had been scribbling random song lyrics on the wall, and it just was a trashy, gross apartment. The floor could barely be seen through all the garbage and empty beer cans that covered almost the entire floor. The bedroom only had a bare mattress on the floor and it was surrounded by different adult magazines. They also found serial killer books. They also found a book on how to survive prison and there was another book that was designed for criminals, giving them tips on how to conduct themselves, what to say, what not to say when they were being interrogated. When police initially interviewed David, he denied it. And the police just looked at him and said, we've been to your apartment. Are you really denying this? And very quickly, David knew he was never going to get away with this. So he did admit to it. And then David tells the story of what happened. We don't know if this is true because obviously we don't have Julie's side of the story, but this is what David told the police. David told the police that him and Julie had met at a pub in Darlington and the two of them had decided to go home to his house to have consensual sex. While they were having sex, David got bored, so he decided to strangle Julie. 
So with Julie passed away now, her body's still laying on the mattress and David goes on to continue the sex that they were having before she had died. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, So I guess David was a fan of necrophilia. He also had other plans for Julie's body. The next day, he cut off a piece of her flesh, took it in the kitchen, cooked it up with garlic, pasta, and cheese, and ate it. David then dragged her body down to the basement where it would stay for weeks. What went on in those weeks, I don't know and I really don't want to know. But the end result was her body was cut up. So police have Julie's torso, but they don't have the rest of her body. And they want to recover the rest of her body so her family can put her to rest. And this sicko, like, it's not bad enough that you took her life and did the most disgusting things to her body. You can't even give her family her body back. Like, it's just... Uh. And what ends up happening because of this is it's... The stories, don't, we're not even, like, there's so much more that happens because they don't recover the rest of the body. And it's so heartbreaking. During his interrogation, he told the police that he wanted to be the youngest, most notorious serial killer in the UK. Reach for the stars, my friends. Reach for the stars. He also admitted he was destined to get caught because he loved bragging about it. David Harker pled guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. So then they're at sentencing, deciding what his sentence is going to be and where he's going to serve it. A psychiatrist got up on the stand and said that David did suffer from several mental disorders. However, he said that David was so evil that there is no way that him going to a hospital could help him in any way. He said he was pure evil and he should be in prison for the rest of his life. You tell him, Doc. So he was sent to a high security prison. And now we're gonna go into the aftermath. Freddie Newman, who was the father of Julie's two oldest daughters, really, really wanted to recover the rest of Julie's body. He believed for Julie to be at rest, they needed to recover all of her body. And for his daughters, he wanted to be able to do that. So Freddie starts writing to David in prison, trying to see if he can find out where the rest of Julie's body is. And David, like the complete psychopath that he is, turns this into a game. And he's just tormenting this broken hearted man who's just trying to bring some peace to his young daughters. And David's just, he's so evil and disgusting. Freddie Newman never recovered from the loss of Julie. And in 2006, he unalived himself. Alan Taylor, who was the father of Julie's youngest daughter and who was Julie's partner at the time of her, Julie's murder, he as well became completely consumed with Julie's death and wanting to recover 
the rest of her body. Alan Taylor became obsessed with trying to find the rest of Julie's remains. And he spent years digging holes all over Darlington. I don't even know if he really had a rhyme or reason to it. He would just dig holes constantly, just hoping to come across some of Julie. He would also cry at her grave and say, how can I put you to rest when you're not here? Then in 2006, Alan Taylor gave up all hope of ever finding Julie. And his rage just grew more and more as the years passed. And he ended up strangling his best friend with a belt. His best friend, John Morrison, they had, there was no anger or argument or anything between the two of them. It was very confusing to a lot of people why he killed his best friend because they were very close and nothing seemed to have given any type of motive of why he would want to kill his best friend. But we find out why he did it. When he was asked by police, why did you kill John? And he said he was filled with so much rage that he felt like he needed to commit a crime as horrific as what had happened to Julie. But even that explanation, police still questioned it because it still didn't make a lot of sense. And it didn't make sense to people in his life either. Further questioning with police, the motive became a little bit more clear. Alan Taylor told police that he had been suffering from PTSD since Julie was murdered. His alcoholism was completely out of control and he eventually realized he was never gonna find Julie's remains. So his new goal was to get into the same prison that David was in and kill him. And at sentencing, the judge obviously did not put them in the same prison. If you have one person saying he's committing a crime because he wants to go into the prison to kill someone else, obviously they're not going to get put in the same prison. But in my personal opinion, I think they should have put them in the same cell. Had the guards walk away and just see what happens. Alan Taylor was sentenced to life in prison. And at this point, he knew, life in prison, I have no chance of ever finding Julie's remains, and I'm never gonna get the opportunity to kill David. So three months into his sentence, Alan Taylor unalived himself. And that is unfortunately the end of today's story. And on a side note, I thought Darlington sounded like the cutest, quaintest, darling little place in the world. I've been to London, but I've never been anywhere else in England. So if you're from England or if you've traveled in England outside of London, like in the countryside where they have like quaint little villages, let me know what it's like because I'd love to know and I'm not gonna let the Darlington cannibal stop me from wanting to experience the English countryside. So I just wanna say a huge thank you to all my returning subscribers. You guys are absolutely amazing. The channel's growing way faster than I ever thought it would. I'm having so much fun doing this. And thank you to everyone who likes the videos, comments, watches the videos. And I've noticed some of you sharing my videos on Instagram, which is just the most cutest, amazing thing. I absolutely love it. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram, 
it's just abnormally underscore Carolyn. But if you're not into that, don't worry about it. But thank you all so much. And I really, really appreciate you. And I hope you have an amazing day. See you in the next one.